Hello, I'm Simon Owens, and you're listening to The Business of Content, a podcast about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. For today's episode, I interviewed a nutritionist who launched a podcast in 2008 that's generated over 35 million downloads. Monica Reinigal had no background in broadcasting or radio when she launched a podcast called Nutrition Diva in 2008, but she was a trained nutritionist, had published several books, and was writing a regular column at a popular health website. And this was just the sort of background that Quick and Dirty Tips, a podcast network run by the book publisher Macmillan, was looking for when she reached out to it to ask the company if it would consider taking her on. Flash forward a decade, and Reinigold now has over 500 episodes under her belt, and they've generated a collective 35 million downloads. I sat down with her recently to discuss how she benefited from joining a podcast network, where she gets the ideas for new topics, and why she has to be super picky when choosing which brands she'll allow to sponsor her show. Let's jump right into it. Hey, Monica, thanks for joining us. Pleasure to be here, Simon. So you have this podcast called Nutrition Diva. Uh, I think it just surpassed something around 35 million downloads. How did it get started? I was recruited to join the Quick and Dirty Tips Network of podcasts. And uh, you've had our director, Kathy Doyle, on your show before. I think it's been a, a few months, but that's a, it's a network of podcasts started by Mignon Fogarty. She's probably best known as the Grammar Girl. And she teamed up with Macmillan Publishing to launch really one of the first podcasting networks. And I joined that network as one of the first hosts back in 2008. Uh, And I have to say, when I became a podcaster, I barely knew what a podcast was. (laughs) And neither did a lot of the people that were, that I was telling about it. And uh, what was the, like, did you approach, because I've talked to other people who have joined the Quick and Dirty Tips network. Some of them were pitched by Kathy. Some were big fans of like Mignon Fogarty and pitched themselves. How did, what was kind of the, because what's your, your background actually is a nutritionist. So they, they like to bring in subject matter experts to host their own kind of uh, uh, news you can use type of podcasts that get, that are giving kind of actionable advice. What was that dynamic for you? That's exactly right. I was, I am trained as a nutritionist and I was at that point blogging for a big nutrition site called nutritiondata.com was subsequently bought by Condé Nast and rolled into their self magazine site. But I was uh, blogging there and I was actually being interviewed on someone else's podcast on some topic of nutrition. And when we got off the air, I was just kind of chatting with the engineer afterward. And he said, have you ever thought about podcasting? You should check out this podcast called Grammar Girl. They're these short little focused podcasts on um, you know, subject areas and they're building a network and maybe you would be a good candidate for that. So I, I did check out the Grammar Girl podcast and I went to the Quick and Dirty Tips website to see who else they had in their stable because it did seem like nutrition would be a natural fit for that sort of expert driven, uh, quick, as you say, news you can use. Yeah format. And I couldn't believe that they didn't have a nutritionist yet. So yes, I reached out to them, sent in a, an inquiry to the publisher at that point was Richard Rohr. And he shared with me that uh, they had been looking for a nutritionist for, for a while. They did see that as being a, a perfect fit for the network that they were trying to build, but they were having trouble finding someone who took a sort of science grounded, evidence-based approach because that was very much in line with Mignon's approach. Um, she was a science editor before she did the the Grammar Girl podcast. And the people that were pitching themselves to them tended to not have uh, credentials in the field and be more maybe popularists or something. And, and they were really looking for somebody who would be able to bring that science background to it. So I recorded a couple of sample episodes and they brought me on. And last week we just published our 500th episode. And what was kind of the learning curve for like figuring out like, cause you know, a lot of, uh, you know, people, whether they're podcasters or YouTubers or whatever, they have to kind of find what's that narrative kind of beat that they're going to have that, that their audience will respond to. Was it, did, did you figure it out? Is it, do, do po- your episodes today sound exactly like they did back then? Like what, what did you learn as you were uh, starting to record these episodes? I'm sure they didn't. I'm sure that there's been an evolution over the 10 years and just, you know, in my trajectory as a, a writer and, and podcaster, but I did hit right away what turned out to be one of the core features of this podcast. And that was in taking a popular meme or a trend diet or a study that was getting a lot of play in the headlines and 
either debunking or unpacking or bringing a contrary point of view, a, you know, a, a point counterpoint kind of approach. And people really seem to appreciate that. And it unleashed this tidal wave of questions. I was a little nervous when I started that after you know, 50 weeks of this, I'd run out of things to talk about. Um, but uh, people responded to that almost immediately by writing in with their questions. I read this. Someone told me that. My sister insists that, you know, can you look into this or what's your take? And uh, so the listeners actually ended up supplying the lion's share of the content ideas. All I really have to do to figure out what I want to write this week's podcast on is open up my email box and just pick the you know, the best question, but I do, I have come up with a sort of rule. And that is if I get three emails in one day about the same topic or the same book or the same headline, then whatever was planned for that week's podcast gets pushed back a week. And that's the topic of this week's podcast. Yeah. It's funny. You're not the first content creator who's told me that where they go in worrying that they're going to run out of stuff to do. But then once they get into the flow, like of having either a spreadsheet or a Microsoft Word document or Google doc, where they just th start throwing ideas in, they start realizing that they're, they have way more ideas or things in that document than they could ever, uh, ever get around to actually you know, covering. Uh, and that certainly helps, obviously, when you have something where people are actually writing in and requesting stuff, because then you have even a, a, a bigger fountain of ideas, basically. Yes. On the other hand, after 10 years of doing this on a weekly basis, the number of questions that I've already answered is getting larger and larger. So very often the questions that are coming in, it's as simple as just hitting reply and saying, oh, I did a podcast on this. Here's a link to it. So, uh, so a greater number of those get sort of filtered out that way. And I think all content producers probably find that there are times when your slush pile of topic ideas is so deep and it just feels uh, um, so secure to have all of those ideas uh, ready to go. And then for some reason, sometimes it just seems to dry up a little bit. You're kind of getting to the bottom of the stack and there might even be a week or two where you're really casting around looking for a good topic, one that people are going to be interested in, but that also that you care enough about to spend <laughs> those hours, uh, you know, researching and crafting and, and recording. Uh, but fortunately, those little dry spells never seem to last for long. And more often than not, yeah, I've always got at least 10 or 12 things in my queue of things that I want to tackle. Yeah, and your your library is pretty big now to where I've noticed your episodes that I listened to were very self-referential. So like you'll do kind of sub branches of topics that you've already covered. So you did one on intermittent fasting, but you'd already done one on fasting in general. So you've referred back to uh, you know, that original episode. And I'm guessing in the article version of the podcast, you're able to link back um, to that. So it, it kind of, you're kind of building on top of content that you've already created. Exactly. And that allows me to keep the format short because sometimes there's something important that really should be added to a conversation. But if I've already done a podcast on it, I can just refer people back to that earlier uh, podcast to kind of fill in that bit of background. And I ho don't have to be constantly repeating myself in the podcast. And yes, that is a part of our web strategy. We are maybe a little unique among podcasting networks in that all of our shows are fully scripted. So they're not an impromptu interview, usually not an impromptu interview like you and I are having now, but a, an actual article that I write from start to, to finish as an article that then becomes a page on our, on our webpage. And then I record it as the podcast. So the web presence is a much bigger part of our strategy and, and being able to uh, link internally to all of that previous content is an important part of that. Yeah. And I talked to Kathy and Mignon about that, that it's very synergistic because the website itself gets a lot of traffic from people. Who, and so that, uh, you know, A, creates a lot of good content for search engines because you guys, because you're, you're, you're addressing problems that people ha actually have. A lot of them are punching those questions into Google and ending up on your site. Mm -hmm. uh, the articles themselves help promote the podcast. So it's another way to try to, you know, get the word out about the podcast, but it also, the, the website makes money itself. It sells like, because there are articles and it's like an actual traditional media website, it's able to, you know, you do display ads and, and different stuff and like that. So there's a lot of synergies to it. What do you notice from being part of a network that you wouldn't get from just being out on your own? Well, one of the biggest advantages for me was all of the production support and, um, administrative and promotional support that I get from Macmillan, that would have been a 
pretty steep learning curve for me to not only have to worry about the actual content and shaping that and producing that, but also having to uh, solve all the technical details and figure out how and when to start uh, looking for sponsors and, and different ways of monetizing. So I think one of the biggest strengths is that we can sort of divide and conquer. We have people who can do that much more effectively than I can. And then that leaves me free to really focus on the two parts of it that only I can do, which is bring my expertise to the topic. And then the other thing I think is sort of my essential role in the in the network is building the the relationship with the audience. And I spend an enormous amount of time and have the entire time doing that. Um, and, and I don't know if I would be able to spin all of those plates at, at the same time. So I'm just so grateful to have other people uh, who can take care of some of those other details um, and free me up to really spend my time and energy on those aspects of it. And what does that entail to, to build a relationship with the audience outside of the podcast itself? What are you doing on kind of like a weekly basis? Well, I uh, immediately from the beginning, we launched branded uh, social media channels to go with the podcast. And back then, uh, Google Plus was still sort of making a play and there was uh, Twitter and Facebook and um, a few others. And I kind of decided that there was no way I was going to be able to really invest in six different social media channels. And so I kind of just threw a dart at the dartboard and I picked Twitter and Facebook. And those were the two that I decided to invest in. So uh, launched those channels. And whenever you're launching a new social media channel and podcast, it does take a while to build up your audience. Um, I brought some audience with me, people that had been reading my blog for years and um, and knew me through that. But it was really just spending time on those social media channels, not just sending the content that I was creating each week out tweeting that out, but um, really in dialogue with the people who were listening to the podcast and uh, and interacting on social media, I tried to make myself very available to them for to answer questions and for uh, to respond or to to talk further about something that we were talking about in the podcast, especially if it turned out to be a little provocative or controversial. And to really engage that way. And I think that that, and I, the good news is I really enjoy doing that. It's one of the things that I like most about a digital media platform. Um, I was, in, I enjoyed that about blogging as well, is that the feedback loop is so short. I had written a couple of books before I got into blogging and the feedback loop couldn't be longer. You finish your manuscript and then a year later, you're doing your book promotion. And and then maybe you get some reviews or you hear, you get an email or something from somebody that read your book, but with a blog or a podcast or a social media channel, it's almost a real time conversation. And I find that very gratifying to be able to build relationships over years with listeners and, and readers that have literally, literally been with me from the start. And I feel like I really know who they are and what they're about and, and vice versa. And that just makes it sort of cozy, really. <laughs> And you, so you've been podcasting long enough, you said 2008, right? Uh, that you've likely seen the various waves of adoption of podcasts. Like there was the point when Apple launched a dedicated podcast app on its home screen. You know, there was the phenomenon that was serial. What did you notice in your own download numbers over time? Like, you know, you're talking about, you know, building that relationship with the audience. Was it just if you were to graph it, was it just slow and steady? Or did you actually see some of these these uh, big events like actually impact your numbers where you were seeing suddenly these huge spikes, you know, like where like one summer you would see some kind of, you know, doubling of your audience or something like that. Well, again, because we sort of divide and conquer, I do not like pour over those numbers and those download numbers. Every once in a while they tell me what the number is. And I'm always like, wow, that's, that's a big number. <laughs> No, I obsess about what's my next topic, you know, what what research do I need to do or who do I need to call and interview about this topic. So once I'm finished with it, I'm just about interacting with the people that are consuming it. And fortunately for me, uh, you know, the, the folks at Macmillan are watching those numbers and, and figuring that out. So, uh, so I don't follow those numbers. What I noticed was like with any venture, the, the growth is so small at the beginning and then it, it comes... There, there comes a sort of tipping point where you have enough episodes and enough listeners that might be talking about you and enough 
people on social that might share something that you start to see a little bit more of a uh, logarithmic growth, you know, to to those numbers. It, it doesn't stay linear. It gets to the point where it starts to multiply. The doubling time gets a lot shorter in terms of your audience. Um, and then, of course, with the the thing that I noticed making the biggest impact was, as you mentioned, cereal. That was something that just seemed to turn everybody into somebody who knew what a podcast was, knew how to get one, had probably listened to one. And once you have, whereas before then, there were people that had done that. And then there were a lot of people that really didn't know what I did, really didn't understand what I did or how to find me or, or how to access it. And Serial seemed to, it from my uh, chair, seemed to be the sort of mainstreaming event for podcasts. And once somebody has listened to one pun- podcast and you know overcome that barrier, that hurdle, like, where do I find it? How do I hear it? Once they've cracked that code, then all the other podcasts are there for them to discover. Um, so I think we all owe Serial. Ad- and then, of course, the NPR podcasts, I think, also really made podcasting so much more of a legitimate media uh, enterprise and not just sort of a, when I first started, I I always felt like it was sort of a fringy little thing that I was doing. And now I feel very mainstream. And it's interesting that like Serial had such downstream effects because you're obviously your podcast has nothing to do with true crime or anything relating to Serial so that it had that much of an impact to where it really was just about getting someone to download a podcast for the first time and giving them that confidence that once they were able to do that, they were able to then slowly branch out and start exploring, you know, what else am I interested in? And then that kind of sure. lifted all boats, basically. Or they they hear about a podcast, maybe they hear it mentioned on a radio interview or somebody mentions it. And instead of just being like, oh, okay, a podcast, they think, wait, I know how to find that. And they can actually follow up on that tip. So I think all of a sudden, these references that may have been going by for them in their social life have an actionable component. They've got a podcatcher on their phone, or they, you know, they have a, a way to to find that, and so it becomes much more likely that they'll say, "Oh, I, I will check that out." The other thing that that I notice, um, you know, to the extent that I do kind of look at the the numbers, is the the holiday bump. So every year for the winter holidays, people get devices, and and so when you get a new device, you play around with it and you see what it can do, and uh, and that always seems to bring a new, you know, a, a fresh wave of podcast listeners. For pe- that's probably tapering off now that everybody has a device, but <laughs> for a while there, the yeah. holidays were a great bump just because everybody was off from work and had a new toy, you know, on which maybe they were also going to listen to podcasts. Has the McMillian, McMillan Podcast Network, has anyone talked to you guys, uh, the, the po- you know, all the podcasters on the network about smart speakers or trying to incorporate you into any strategy around that? Yes, we have uh, recorded cues and, and things um, to, to let people know how to find our content or how to cue our content on the, the smart speakers. Um, I, I don't know that we've seen that same tipping point with the smart speakers that we've seen with other kinds of devices. But yeah, definitely uh, with our eye on that, um, we would be a, a handy place for people to be able to, to, to quickly access content. From their smart Talk speaker. Talk to me about your book publishing. Uh, so, like one thing that really inf- like fascinated me about the this network and, and what makes it different from a lot of other networks is how it diversifies its revenue and how it like reaches or how it leverages its audience. And and what's cool about this is like a lot of the podcasters who are on the Macmillan Podcast Network um, are also authors for Macmillan. And basically, there's this like synergy between the two where you know you build up this really loyal, intimate audience. And then you write a book on that exact same subject, and then you're able to kind of leverage that audience to sell books. What is you, how many books have you published, and what's kind of how has that worked? Uh, uh, you know, between working between your podcasts and and using that to help you in terms of uh, you know selling your books. That's certainly you know one of the concepts behind the the Quick and Dirty Tips Network and their partnership with Macmillan. But and I I have done one book with them, which was sort of a. Um, a, a compilation, a greatest hits of those first two or three years of Nutrition Diva podcasts. And what I learned through that, so the idea was, yeah, we build this platform and this devoted following through the podcast and all of these people who really f- feel like they know you personally. And I think that that really goes with the audio uh, medium. There's something about having someone's voice in your ear that's different than seeing their words on your screen or on a page. 
So yes, you, you, you've built up an audience of people who feel like they really know who you are and they spend time with you in a, in a more personal, intimate way than they might with an author. And then you bring a book out. And of course, that's going to be a slam dunk. What I have learned is that that can be a, an enormously powerful tool. However, you still have to have a killer book that actually needs to be a book as opposed to content that could be delivered in in some other way. It doesn't relieve you of the obligation to have a really strong book concept, um, something that's really original, something that um, encapsulates some essential thing about what you do and what you know and what you offer that really needs to be brought together in a book. So it's I, I would say it's not just an automatic win, have a podcast, write a book, sell a lot of books. Um, I had other books that I wrote that were not associated with the podcast that actually did better, but I think that was because they had, um, you know, a, a very unique reason for being other than just here's more of me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you like the podcast now here's, you know, here's a, here's more of the podcast sort of in book form. I think that that's not quite enough to, to close that loop. So why not then, you know, since you already have this relationship with the book publisher, why not move forward with trying to. Uh, pitch more original concepts for the books, for new books coming. Certainly that's, yeah, always something that is kind of in the back of your mind. But I have to tell you, having been, you know, a book author for, for several years and then doing the digital media, to be perfectly honest with you, I really enjoy the immediacy of digital media. I have my books, you know, and so I've I've sort of punched that card. I've established, yes, I can write an entire book and it can be between hard covers and published by a major publishing house. You know, I've rung that bell. And I don't itch for more of that because I find what I do through the digital medium ultimately more satisfying. I like the pace of it better. I like the interaction of it better. And the platform that I have built with the podcast, I've chosen to leverage in other ways. I do a lot of public speaking and presentations. I do um, continuing education for other health professionals. I do corporate wellness uh, programming. And I have some um, programs that I run, sort of coaching programs that I run for listeners that they can sign up and do with me. Uh, and, and those are the ways that I have enjoyed uh, um, taking advantage of the platform that the podcast helped me build. And that may just be sort of a personality thing. Some authors really would like to spend most of their time alone in a room <laughs> with, with a keyboard. I am an extrovert. I really like interacting with people. And, and so I'm naturally drawn to the kinds of things that you can do with a platform that involved more, that involve more contact with people, um, and more sort of immediacy. So the podcast raises your profile and then that gets, that makes you a, a little bit easier for you to get those kind of speaking gigs, trainings, consulting work, that kind of stuff. So, it, so there is a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about yeah. uh, advertising? Like I noticed that uh, a lot of you, you, every single episode I listened to, it, it had at least one, sometimes more than one sponsor. They were host read ads. Um, how do you get those? So again, this is part of our divide and conquer strategy. We have um, team members at McMillan Audio who um, work with Midroll and they manage that whole process, which uh, in my case often involves vetting the would-be sponsors. Nutrition podcasts are often very attractive to sponsors that I don't feel comfortable uh, endorsing if it's a product that I don't feel has solid science or you know is 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 in line with my philosophy, my nutritional philosophy, then I don't really feel comfortable doing a live read ad for it because I, I take that responsibility very seriously. It's a very powerful endorsement to have an expert that you trust say, I think you should have this, buy this, use this. And, um, and so I'm, I'm sort of picky about, about the things that, uh, that I feel comfortable using as sponsors. I know that gives them fits at McMillan, but they've been nothing but supportive and they've totally gone to the mat for me with mid-roll and with sponsors. Um, and, and I know that they have turned away good sponsorship money just because I felt like it was not worth trading my credibility or um, the trust of my listeners to read an ad for something that I didn't feel good about. So you're not doing any ads for Gwyneth Paltrow's Goop anytime soon is what you're saying? I'm just going to leave that right there on the table where you left it. <laughs>
Okay. Um, but I noticed, so at least for the ones I listen to, they seem to be at least for the main, main part, kind of at least related to the subject matter of your, uh, of your podcast. Like these aren't, you're not doing things for like MailChimp or Squarespace. You seem to like the, the most mainstream that I heard was HelloFresh. So, but they're all related to like uh, nutrition. It seems like. Yeah. Nutrition, food, um, sometimes just sort of related lifestyle, you know, household uh, goods. To tell you the truth, I would love to do ads for you know somebody like Mailchimp. They're actually who I use to manage my mailing list, um, and you know I find them to be you know a really usable service. I use a lot of those kinds of tech services in running my business, and I'd be happy to to give positive endorsements to the ones that uh, that have helped me build my business. But for some reason, I don't know. Like the, they think that people who are listening to a nutrition podcast only want to hear about you know nutrition and. Um, and that that's the natural fit. I sometimes think that it would be more interesting for all of us if they could widen their their view a little bit and and be like, yeah, I'm a, I do all kinds of things besides write about nutrition, and all of those would be would be great uh, fodder for me to say, I love this project project product. I use it all the time. You know, this has really made my life easier. It doesn't necessarily need to be a nutritional supplement, um, and I you know. It would be honest. It would be sincere. And I imagine that the people that listen to my podcast also have other aspects of their lives in which they use lots of different kinds of products. But I'm not in advertising. Um, that's not my my area of expertise. So I, I try to just leave that to the people who understand those things better. And most of the ads you're still doing kind of mirror what's going on in the larger industry and that they're mostly direct response, right? Like here, use this offer code, um, right. kind of stuff, less brand advertising. Every once in a while, they will, I will get an ad and there is no um, direct, there's no promo code or no specific URL that they're directed to. And I always find that kind of interesting because I wonder how they measure the return on investment. But again, that's somebody else's problem to worry about. So you have an upcoming uh, spinoff podcast. Tell me about that. Uh, the Faces of Farming series? Yes. This is actually part of the nutrition. So it's going to be episodes 501 through 505 of the Nutrition Diva podcast. But it is something new for us. As we were getting close to the 500th episode and my 10-year anniversary, I was sitting with my editor, Joe Muscolino, and my previous editor, Alyssa Martino, who went on uh, at to, to moved over to the Macmillan podcast side of the business. And we all had lunch together and we're kind of brainstorming. And I was really just casting around for some way to make, to keep this fresh. You know, I've been doing these weekly episodes now for 10 years and I was like, let's, and I see the podcasting industry evolving around me and all these exciting new things happening and people trying new formats and, um, you know, really being very innovative and creative. And I was starting to feel like, oh gosh, we've just been doing, yes, we have this very successful formula um, that we've been doing for a long time, but wouldn't it be fun to experiment with some new things? And so this is one of the things that we decided to experiment with. It is a series of interviews on the topic of agriculture. Each week I'm interviewing a uh, a professional, a farmer, essentially from a different sector of agriculture. So I talked to a cattle rancher, to a vegetable grower, to an almond farmer, farmer, to, um, to really get some insight, like a virtual visit to their farm for the listeners. What happens there? What's it look like? What do you do all day? What does it take? What, what's the hardest thing about your job? What's the most rewarding thing about your job? And it's sort of organized around the Thanksgiving holiday harvest season, you know, a, a way to, um, to, to appreciate the people who work really hard to put food on our table. And that's the link then for me with, with nutrition. Um, but also just a, a opportunity to experiment with a longer running topic that we spun out over the course of several episodes, and then also doing something that I really hardly ever do on the podcast, and that is an interview format. So I'm really curious. I've, I've really enjoyed doing it. I, the, the interviews are really exciting for me and really fresh, and I hope that other people will uh, will enjoy it too. But I'm curious to see what the feedback from the listeners will be because you know, the, the, the trick here for us is to balance, you know, not ruining what we have that's working so well and still finding ways to experiment with what could also work or what could work better. So, you know, whenever you change things up, people get 
you know, nervous. And so we're trying to keep enough the same, but build some, some room for some experimentation so that we can, you know, think about what the next 10 years might bring that will keep us all engaged and excited and also keep up with this new medium that's grow- that's now growing so fast um, in content and volume and also just in exposure. So to be part of that. So if it is if it is successful, you could see maybe more thematic seasons for your podcast where you, rather than just doing one subject at a time, you you, you try to bite off something even much larger and, and do it over a multi-episode arc. Exactly. Um, or try... Uh, you know, this format went on a different topic or, or different ways of organizing this, you know, this approach, um, different formats and yeah, try some things and let our listeners tell us what they enjoy, what they, you know, taking into account that there'll be a little bit of pushback, like, Hey, where's, where's what, where's the podcast I'm used to. Um, but let them tell us what they find, uh, interesting and intriguing and let that guide us. And, and maybe potentially could lead to, what you suggested, you know, an actual, a spinoff, a, a new product. If something really seemed to have traction and be worth pursuing, um, then that would be a conversation that we could have. Should we make this a new thing that's all about this all the time? Um, but it's a great way to sort of lab those things and, and, and try them out and see how they go and see what people like and what we enjoy, what I enjoy doing. But this one will be in the main Nutrition Diva feed. They don't have to subscribe to something different. That's correct. No, it it will just come to them in their feed and we'll, you know, we're really trying to set it up so that they understand, okay, this is, uh, you know, a little something different here. And um, we've also uh, been working with our distributors to try to shine an an extra light on this as something special and something interesting and get a little bit extra promotional lift from uh, iTunes and Stitcher and SoundCloud and all of those um, distributors that that we partner with uh, as something that will be of particular interest to their listeners and deserve a little place on the the banner at the top of the page, and, and yeah, but but it will actually be in the in the regular sequence. Okay, Monica. Well, those were all the questions I had. Where can people find you online? The podcast is at nutritiondiva.quickanddirtytips.com, and of course on whatever. Uh, podcatcher you use. You can just search for Nutrition Diva. And on social media, on Facebook and Twitter, I am at Nutrition Diva. And I'd love to connect with anybody that heard this podcast and has questions or would like to say hello. Thank you so much, Simon, for the opportunity. My pleasure. Okay. It was great uh, talking to you. Bye-bye. Okay. That's all we have for you today. Be sure to subscribe to the Business of Content on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. See you next week.